There you go. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank each and every one of you here to West Main uh, Church of Christ. And, and we're thankful for you being here. Uh, we do have guests and we're thankful for you being here. Please give us that privilege and an opportunity to see if in some way we can help you. And, and, and we're thankful for your presence. Uh, have a good number tonight uh, and uh, look forward to Doug's lessons on patience. And uh, uh, it is in our word book, but everyone needs a lot of it, including me. So, uh, but also wanted to give you an update on something that, that came about. We're trying to do this as an eldership as they come about. Um, the uh, uh, tower, uh, the satellite tower, or tower over across the street is full and not working properly. They've approached us and, and we've, we've talked to them and, and, uh, and, and, and looked at it and uh, uh, back for, put one all the way in the back of the, uh, of the land back there. So uh, we, uh, you got to pass Lee County stuff, uh, Tupelo stuff, uh, also even Natchez Trace things because you can see it from, from Natchez Trace. There's a lot of hoops to jump through. A lot of the people around there uh, have to look at it and everything. So we'll continue to, to follow along and keep you updated on that, but wanted you to know that. So, and we'll continue as we find different things and, and, and look at different things that we'll make sure that, that you're aware of. So, but we're here for one reason, and that is to worship God. And, we, uh, and if you will, would you bow with me and pray with me? Holy and Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your love. We're thankful for this avenue of prayer. Father, we know that you're God. We know that, that you're the creator, that, that we love you so much, and that you want each and every one of us to go to heaven. And, but we also know that, that, that you are a jealous God, and we, and we pray that at each day of our lives that we'll realize that, that we love you, that we need to, to worship you in a manner that's pleasing to you that we need to worship from our hearts. Father, help us as we do uh, worship and ha as we learn from your word. Help us to take that word and, and analyze it, look at it, live it, and love it, and use it each day of our lives, Father. Help us to continue to uh, plant the seed and, 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 and turn it over to you and, and help us to continue to look to those around us and and have a smile on our face and love in our heart so that they can ask us what, what makes us smile so much. And we can tell them our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because he died for us. And he wants us to live with him in eternity. Please be with us. Help us, Father. Keep us humble. Keep us loving. And in all things, that all the glory is yours forever and ever. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Number 277, 277, I have heard of a land. All three verses.
song before our prayer will be number 482. 482. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessings of it, Lord. Thank you for uh, all the things that you do for us all the time, Lord. Please be with those that are sick, Lord, and please heal them if it be your will, Lord. Please be with those that have lost loved ones. Heal them, Lord, and uh, comfort them. And be with those that are serving overseas, Lord. Please be with Brother Williams and his family as they are moving to Tupelo, Lord. Help their move to be a smooth transition, Lord. Be with Brother Doug tonight as he gives us our lesson and give him a ready recollection of those things he has prepared. Dear Lord, please be with the elders and deacons of this congregation, Lord. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. The invitation song will be number 337, 337. For the lesson, we'll sing number 660, if you will, stand as we sing.
scripture reading tonight will be from Hebrews chapter 11, verses 35 through 40. Women, re women received back their dead re resurrection. Uh, some were tortured, refusing to accept release, so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and, and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sewn in two, they were killed with a sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all, and all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. We're in a series of lessons through the devotional book entitled One Word, where each week one word is taken, and then you have five days worth of devotionals related to that word, and I'm behind, but I will catch up eventually, and we started off behind, so you won't finish your one word for another couple of months, but we'll at least get closer to catching up after tonight as we look at the one word of, of the week, and that is suffering. We look tonight at the idea of patience in suffering. If you have your worship bulletin and your writing instrument handy, notice that one of the amazing things about the Bible is its realism. The Bible presents things as they really are and does not candy coat it, does not present it idealistically, but realistically. And when we read in the Bible about the people who've gone before us, we see that even the most saintly of biblical characters still had imperfections. And if I had been writing the Bible, I would have been tempted to hide those imperfections, at least to de-emphasize them. But people are pictured as they really were and they had their challenges. Some were emotional, some were physical, and a whole lot of them were spiritual. So every person in the Bible is portrayed in all of their humanity. And we see them struggle with temptation and sin. We see them suffer, sometimes betrayed by loved ones, lied to or cheated on. And sometimes we observe a long spell in their life when God seems to be silent and absent. So there's a lot there for us to relate to, and it sounds a lot like our experience. And that brings us to number B. Not only is the Bible very realistic, but the Bible speaks so realistically about the reality of suffering. I think if one did not read the Bible, but just posed the question about should Christians suffer, the answer would be a resounding no. First of all, because our human side doesn't want to suffer. And secondly, because we understand that becoming Christian deals with our biggest problem, that is our sin problem, and improves the quality of our life, we sometimes apply that in every area of life. And sometimes becoming a Christian does not simplify every area of life. We're going to have issues. We're going to have suffering. Job 5 and verse 7 says, Yet man is born to trouble as surely as sparks fly upward. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, John 16 and verse 33. James does not pose it as a possibility, but as an inevitability in chapter 1 and verse 3, when he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. In verse 12 he said, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the victor's crown. And that brings us to our lesson text for the evening, which is found in James chapter 5 and verse 7. And it reads like this, and it's from which we get the title of our lesson. It says, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. 
James was written to people scattered hither and yonder who were experiencing suffering. They were experiencing things like famine and poverty and persecution, but James had a very important word from the Lord to help them stand up under these things, and that word is patience. And he gave them and us one thing to do and two things to avoid. And so there's our three-point sermon. First of all, what should we do when we're suffering? That is, be patient. Now that's the last thing that we want to hear when we're in the midst of difficulties. Because many of us, if not most of us, and perhaps all of us, have a patience problem. You might just, if you're wondering if you have a patience problem, turn and look at your neighbor. And if they're grinning at you, you have a patience problem. Now how's that? My wife's grinning at me. And I do have a patience problem. In his book, Killing Giants, Pulling Thorns, a man by the name of Charles Swindoll writes, those late takeoffs, those grocery lines, those busy restaurants, those trains, what fertilizer for the thorns of impatience your waitress will not likely be impressed that you can prove the authorship of the Pentateuch, nor will the gal at the checkout stand stand in awe as you inform her of the distinct characteristics of biblical infallibility. One quality, however, a single rare virtue, scarce as diamonds and twice as precious, will immediately attract them to you and soften their spirits. And that quality? is this ability to accept delay graciously, calmly, quietly, understandingly, with a smile. If the robe of purity is far above rubies, the garment of patience is even beyond that. But alas, the garment seldom clothes us. If you don't remember anything else out of this lesson, remember this next sentence. <coughs> Excuse me, and that is we are often in a hurry, but God is not. We are often in a hurry, but God is not. God, by dealing with us, deals in the realm of people in time, but by nature, God is eternal. And none of us likes delays, especially when it's our turn to experience the pain of suffering. But patience is what God is trying to develop in us, and patience is what is often called for. And notice I use the word develop. It is an attribute that is acquired over time. And James, in chapter 5 and verse 7, gives a command, and it's not a suggestion. It's a command. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. Now, the commentaries have looked at various ways that James might have meant what he said when he said the Lord's coming. Perhaps he's talking about the Lord sending aid to us in answer to our prayer when we're in difficult times. In, in other words, in an everyday sense. But I think more likely the obvious rendering is more accurate and that is the day that Christ returns at the end of time. We must acknowledge that for some of us there will be very little if any relief from some kind of suffering from this point till our walk is finished on this earth. Now we feel helpless when we get in that situation or someone that we love gets in that situation. But for some, our only relief will come when Jesus returns or when we go to meet him in death. And I think that's what our text says tonight when it says, be patient until the Lord's coming. James goes on then to illustrate what this patience looks like, and he uses three examples the idea of farmers, prophets, and then the patriarch, Job. 
Think for a moment about his first example, the idea of patience required in farming. I guess that's why I wouldn't have made a very good farmer because the farmer has to wait several months and sometimes years in the case of growing timber or fruit trees to harvest a crop. The farmer can learn the laws of nature as God has designed them. He can anticipate what stages must be progressed through to the harvest, such as seed germination, plant growth, and finally fruit production. But there is literally, practically speaking, nothing that he can do to speed up this process. And what little control he has over the process, he cannot control the weather. And so the temperature and the rainfall or lack thereof can either have a lot of good or bad effect relative to the harvest. He cannot control the soil. He can only try to enhance it. He cannot control the seed as to whether it germinates or does not germinate. And for the small time farmer 2,000 years ago, waiting could have been very difficult. His family literally might be going hungry a lot of the time while they were waiting for the harvest. In Bible times, a farmer was be on a small scale and a farmer had to be patient. But why was he willing to wait? James says that the result could be a valuable crop, or your translation might say a precious crop, because a harvest is truly worth waiting for. And so it is in our lives, God is a farmer, and we're a farmer planting his seed in us, watching and waiting for it to grow, trying to enhance the process, overall requiring a lot of patience because we trust that the harvest, that is a mature Christian life, will be truly valuable and worth it. The second illustration of patience that James gives us was that of the prophets. And certainly the Jewish people that James was writing to would understand how the prophets were a great example of patience. For one thing, though they were God's spokesperson, yet they often suffered greatly. And you know, the devil tries to tell faithful Christians that our suffering must be an indication that we're living outside the will of God. But some who suffered the most in Bible times were those who were right smack in the middle of God's will. The example of the prophets proves that our suffering might well be because of our faithfulness and not because of our unfaithfulness. So we should not ever make the mistake to allow ourselves or the new Christian or anybody else for that matter to think that God has abandoned us in times of suffering. Jesus himself suffered, but it, it was not because he was disobedient, but because he was obedient, his suffering led to a cross. And nearly all of the prophets suffered persecution and extreme hardship. Think about Elijah, who was hated by Ahab, Jezebel, and others, and then go and read 1 Kings chapter 18. The prophet Amos was falsely accused of conspiracy against the powers that be. Amos chapter seven, verses 10 through 13. The prophet Jeremiah was thrown into a dry cistern and threatened with starvation in Jeremiah chapter 38. In addition to persevering and suffering, the prophets also encourage us by reminding us that God physically cares for us when we go through sufferings for his sake. We may have to suffer along with others because of our humanity, because God sins or God allows certain things to happen where we happen to be living at the time. Think about the fact that Elijah announced to King Ahab, a very wicked man, that there would be a drought in the land for three and a half years. 
And yet Elijah himself had to suffer in that drought. And yet God cared for him. Elijah did not starve to death. God preserved his existence during that very difficult time. And sometimes God's prophets were delivered from their suffering and sometimes not in the way that we expected. As was read in our scripture reading and as Hebrews chapter 11 reminds us, others were tortured and refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were put to death by the sword, they went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Now someone along about now might ask, well, why is it that God's people often have to endure such difficult trials? Wouldn't it make better sense that when we became a Christian, our life became magically improved to the point that we just didn't have to suffer like other people suffered? And the biblical answer to that is not really the answer that we want to hear, but the biblical answer is that suffering is allowed, trials are allowed, and maybe even sent by God, so that our lives might back up our message. Our perseverance in suffering is a tremendous testimony to those around us. And then think about the final illustration that's given, the patience of Job. In Job chapter 1, 1 to 3, my Bible reads that Job was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. If we had the opportunity to trade places with Job at the end of chapter 1 and verse 3, there's not a one of us that wouldn't say, what a deal. That's the kind of deal I want. But in a day, Job lost it all. And there's no doubt that he suffered terribly. All his worldly possessions were taken. His sons and his daughters were suddenly killed in a freak storm. Painful sores covered his body from head to foot. His wife urged him to abandon his faith, and his friends aggravated him with their awful advice. And through all of this, the Bible says, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Job had no idea why all these calamities were happening. And though Job questioned God, he did not abandon his faith. And that last part is something that we have to decide ahead of time. In fact, in Job 13 and verse 15, he declared, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So let's remind ourselves where we've been. We must learn patience. Like the farmer, we must keep working and waiting for the harvest. Like the prophets, we must be faithful and keep a witness for God in spite of our suffering. And like Job, we must keep trusting even though we don't understand. So that's one thing we need to acquire. Now, Roman numeral two, let's notice two things we must avoid doing while we're suffering. First of all, we must not grumble. In James chapter 5 and verse 9, my Bible reads, Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. When you don't feel well, 
it's easy to complain and grumble. It's easy to see everything in a negative light. It's easy to become quarrelsome. It's easy to take out our frustrations and our troubles on each other. And Satan loves to get Christians fighting each other instead of him. And we must keep in mind, James says, that we're not the judge. And it's not our job to judge others or, for that matter, ourselves when suffering comes and we become frustrated and impatient because God is the judge and we don't want to cause him to have to make a harsh judgment against us. So we must not grumble. Second, verse 12 says, while suffering, we must not swear. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, here's what James says. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. Let your yes be yes and your no, no, or you will be condemned. Now, James, in this context, was not talking about swearing in the sense of cursing. He was not even talking about giving an oath in court. James' concern was with the kind of swearing in the giving of our word, in the giving of personal oaths. And you say, well, what does this kind of swearing have to do with sufferings? Well, if you've ever suffered much, you know how easy it is to say things you don't mean. And you know how easy it is to make promises to God or try to make a bargain with God. And integrity demands, and James says that God demands that our simple yes be yes and our simple no be no. Our speech should be sincere. When we say something, we ought to do it or explain to whomever we said it why we could not and pray they'll give us another chance. And while we suffer, we must be honest with God and with others and truthful and not try to be manipulating deal makers. Now what does all this mean? I understand that we have at any given time a number of people who are suffering greatly. And the last thing that I want to do is come across callously or give the impression that patience in suffering is easy. But the only thing that I can recommend is the declaration that James makes in verse 11, which says, the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. When I look at all of this in the epistle of James, what I know for sure is that God loves us. What I know for sure is that Jesus is coming back What I know for sure is that God is full of compassion and mercy. And what I know for sure is that we have the promise that he will reward our patience and faithfulness. So what does that mean? It means let's decide ahead of time, no matter what, let's trust God. He is aware of our situation and yet he is allowing it. And something great can come from our suffering if we are patient and focus on the eternal. Because friends, this life is not all there is. And no matter how long you live, it won't even be the beginning of what eternity is like. And so we're headed for a forever place. And where we are right now is not it. And if someone said, well, uh, I could undergo suffering for three seconds, well, you probably could. You could probably manage it for three seconds, maybe even three minutes, maybe even three hours. I don't know how much beyond that you would confidently say I could deal with it. But I do know that in comparison to eternity, no matter how long we suffer in time, That's not the end of the story. So be patient in suffering. If we can assist you in any way tonight to become a Christian or 
to rededicate your life to the Lord or to pray with you for difficulties that you're undergoing in your life, that's what this moment in our time together has traditionally been set aside for. And we, we don't know your heart unless you share it. We don't know your need unless you share it. James is going to lead us in our invitation song, and whatever your need might be, we invite you to come. Thank you, Doug, for that lesson. Hope you all had a wonderful and restful uh, afternoon. Uh, if you are visiting with us, we ask that you please stay around a few minutes after service so we can talk to you and get to know you. We have some visitors from Starkville this evening, and uh, I haven't got them to commit to moving back home yet, but uh, they are here, so y'all talk to Don and Kathy before they leave tonight. And also, we've got some visitors from over in the Molten Alabama area. Larry and Kay Little are with us this evening and they had uh, just not too long ago returned from a trip over to Russia that they'd been waiting 18 years to get back over there. So uh, we're very proud that they were able to go and uh, Larry is director of the Sictive Car Bible School and uh, so we'll be uh, uh, first part of January be bringing you a report on uh, the school as well as our other mission er efforts. Um, on our announcements, I do have an update. We, we mentioned this morning uh, there are sympathies extended to Melody Powell in the loss of her mother, Loretta Criswell. Those arrangements are complete now. The uh, visitation and funeral will be at Chapman Church of Christ in Ripley. Uh, visitation will be Monday from 5 to 8 and then the funeral will be Tuesday at 2 p.m. And the visitation on Tuesday will begin at 12 noon. So let's be sure and check on Melody and see what we can do to assist that family. Uh, also, the 9th through 12th graders will be having a Christmas party next <clears throat> Sunday night, December 22nd at Logan's house. Please bring a $20 gift card to play Dirty Santa and a meal will be provided. We read a thank you card from the family of, of Dora Turner this morning. We'll put that on the bulletin board. Uh, kit team number three, please remember uh, to meet in the library following services to pick up your assignments uh, for this week and uh, uh, for those uh, visitation cards. Also, communion's been left prepared in the library for those unable to attend this morning during our closing song. 
you can uh, leave the auditorium, uh, turn down to the left and go to the library and someone will be there to assist you. Hope you all have a wonderful and safe week. If those traveling home tonight, please be careful and we'll see you again Wednesday evening. Just stand and sing number seven, Abide With Me. pray. Um, dear God, thank you for this day and this opportunity to be here today and worship you. Thank you for this congregation that you've given us and all of its leaders, and we ask that you be with our leaders and help them in their decisions. Father, we ask that you help um, keep us safe as we go home tonight and keep us safe throughout the rest of the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.